Janice Unwin interviewing James Stewart of Bayview Port Logan on behalf of Cut Maiden Information Centre Oral History Project. Afternoon, Jimmy. Would you like to tell us your earliest memories? Well, of course, I was born at the Clash in 1914, and my earliest memory of the Clash was in October 1917 when it was struck by lightning, when the house was struck by lightning. It was a devastation to say it. That terrible. Uh, there was tremendous damage done to the house, and eventually the flames was smashed and smothering. And I can always remember the smell of sulphur when the you know, next day, and we were taken out into the stair, store shed and away from, because they thought it was a shell from a submarine in, the, in these particular days. And you know, all the water supply was cut off, and it was a very bad uh, strike that. I don't know, flash out was actually struck twice, but that was, we can leave that to later on. Was there any animals that killed in this? No, 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 no. no. The only thing, the dog was struck. The dog had been lying on the mat on the hearth log and the, the board came through below the this like it has chair went up the chimney and the dog was deaf always after that. That was the only thing. So that's my earliest memory, Johnny's and then well I went to Port Logan school till I was about twelve years old and no bus no school buses but I didn't need one and very far to go. And I had the occasion to be at the closing of the Moor School in the summer time there. And they were talking about the role, and I realised that there was more folk at Pabrogan School then than was at the Moor now. Plus, the Model School was also in operation. The Model School. With nearly as many pupils as what Pabrogan had. How many are you talking about at Port Logan then, in these days? Yes. Appro um, approximately how many pupils? 32 to 36, usually. Quite often, there were three teachers at Port Logan. Can you name some of your fellow uh, pupils? Can you name some of your fellow pupils? Oh, I had one in here the other day there, but uh, David Mason, funnily enough, went to school the same day as me, but he was not as fortunate as me. He had to walk all the way from Long Right to the school when he was five years old. And uh, he was in here about what, two months ago, and now lives in here in Young Flats opposite the station. And, uh, well, John Blackwell was one of them, the whole Blackwell family. The Hutton, the whole Hutton family, all the Hutton reeds, and there was a tremendous load of folk came from the farms in these days, you know, and even the Finleys, who were your predecessors at Logan, uh, they were at the school, uh, Spires is from Slehole, and Graham's from Carl A lot of these houses are no longer inhabited. No, no. Oh, well, Slehole has been rebuilt. Mm. And uh, there was Quite a lot of, a lot of oh, people out in the village alone in these days. Uh, still, there were still partisans who eventually finished up in Tarali. They were, his, their father was a local carrier who went to some hour, probably three times a week with a horse and cart. And you say there were three teachers, Jimmy. How was the school divided? How was the school room divided for them? Well, the, the, the end next to the schoolhouse was uh, sort of, it was, it was a square block and there was what is the term, the middle room, which was only occupied if they needed a third teacher and then as you know the one at the fishbone then is a sort of T-shaped to that it's a long, but uh, class one, two and three were in the end next to the schoolhouse three, four, five and six were in the, this end next to the Fishbone tent, you know, next to near the very the T shaped tent. Uh, I was there till I was twelve, but not that I was really clever, but I had got to the stage where I was getting no further. I had gone to class six and I was finished there. And uh, I went to Snowdon Academy for two years. So when we left Snow Academy, Peter and I left the same day. Peter Lasman and I left mm -hmm. the same day, but he was in the same class with me mm -hmm. at Snow Academy. And John Blackwell was. I think John was one behind us. But uh, the day that I left, or the, days, the time I was leaving, 
the local bank managers in these days were the solicitors. You know, it was just a bank manager, a stone hunter, a stone hunter still hunter than money. The original town hunter was the bank manager, and he had been talking to my father and asked if I would like to become a banker. So I had an interview along with Peter Jock, the president, Ian Jock's uncle, butcher. Mm -hmm. And we had an interview with Mr. Hunter on the Friday night. My father was there, and when Mr. Hunter said I could stop in a fortnight and I would get eight shillings a month, I said, well, I'm sorry, I'm going home. <laughs> Get a pair of horse and they had a lot of trouble over that. They had a lot of trouble. And they'd come home and uh, started to work at home after that. The biggest bugbear was carting, which is a more criminal again. Horse and cart in these days. And that would be every day, of course? No, well, my daddy and I worked day about. Oh. We worked together and then in the, the dead of winter put Gill in and my daddy and I all went on the one. We all took it. One of us took it all. Well, everybody took it for everybody. But the, the bugbear in these days, Giants, was the smooth roads. You know, if you got a slippy morning, it was terrible. And you had to have all these horses, studs down into their shoes to, to keep them from slipping, and the, the burden was spread over the way the rest the, the roads are rough, rough now, but they were very, very slippery in these days. So that was my bone of contention. What was the surface then that made them slippery? Was it was it a tar? Well, the tar ran. You see, the tar oh. ran is smooth. You know, we got a length of tar from here to the door, but it just ran down the road, and it was as smooth as ice. And just and it froze. It was dreadful. But in all the events of the recent week, with a sea on the shore road, I never, never was stopped with the sea on the shore road. You're talking on the Drumore Shore Road, Coast I'm talking day. about the Drumore Shore Road, yeah. and there was those wooden groins out in the sea, yeah. which broke the wave, and never had, I never had to turn or go up the glen at any time. Mm. So, so was, tides must have changed or something? No, it's taken away the groins, you know, and it didn't break the water at all. But another thing that did happen there, when they put that bit to the end of the key at Drumore, they threw far more water into the Kilstay Bay than the MOD or the ASC Rescue or whatever they were during the war built about 60 feet on the end of the original harbour. The war harbour originally was a very, very clean place. And I'm not up in the tell you open in a story about the walking on the greasy blanket of the sports at the moor. <laughs> but when you dived into the water at the moor sports, you could have picked taken a sixpence off the shore, you would have seen it. But that all resulted from that. The, the back wash of the tide could not take the the refuse back out of the harbour, and the harbour got very, very contaminated altogether. So when you went with your horse and cart, did you go for the Garrick tree and down the glen? No, I didn't took a lump up. Right. I didn't took a lump up up ashore normally. No, usually you didn't like the Garrick tree because it was slippy. It Although going and Garrick tree and they had to go that way, but very, very seldom I went that way unless I fell in with one of the cook boys coming back and we came together. That would be the only way I would come up the grass today. But uh, the days of when eventually Alex Scott put a law in the road were the great days of my life and we didn't have to go any longer. Uh, what were your other duties on the farm then? It was well, obviously a dairy farm. Oh well you just you did the milking, you did the buyers, you did the the ploughing and well my father worked for quite a long time in, in these days but uh, he didn't walk many horses at all. He did all the general farm work that was to be done. Very much different from now, Johnny's, because you bring in a combine and that's it finished. You brought enough thousand them out twice a year, maybe. And these days, you know, there was 12 or 13 people there at a, at a thrashing. Made life an awful... It's very, very different from what it was, what it is now. It's all practically done within the... What, Make ten days the house is finished if you get well you need to get the weather certainly so but the, the modern way of doing it is it's thrashed and all in the first go. That was a uh, it wasn't long left school that I took an interest in ploughing and I ploughed it the first ploughing match in the ground when I was sixteen. And uh, I ploughed it eight ploughing matches I think. But I never won a medal, I thought. How many people would compete at these events? Oh, maybe 14, 16 or 18 ploughs you'd get in these days. It's quite a... Uh, it's very, very popular in these days that uh, the men ploughing. 
Ja su još vijek mūsu vērīt, mūsu vērīt, o, da var tevi māc, es nemrīt pārēs, un izdēļ, lai mūs to nekār, kā komen, ne, nenš, uz šokā gāda ropa, da uru lot, kem, da gāda, un plēdē tenš, kā ir māc. How many horses would pull your plow? Two. I had two pair of horses always in the plow. And uh, I was eight, seven, six, fifth disqualified, third, fourth, second. Never first? Never first. I was never first. first. Why, why were you disqualified? For well, not having finished. And that field in the mayor's hood there. Uh, I was disqualified for not having finished. That was why. Did you have famous judges for these events or were they just local people? The judges, the judges were mostly outsiders. They were not local, no. He didn't. No, no, it wasn't a done thing to have local judges. I've judged twice in, within the last ten years at Glenlis. But I only on the sharp once and uh, Bobby did once. So, but when I finished that day at Glenlis, I said to Bobby, where's the nearest door we can get out before we start the raising the prize? Well, everybody seemed quite happy because I've still been asked back again. Oh. Take land loose, but I wouldn't go to this. I was going to walk over playing at 76 year old. How do you <coughs> ascertain a good plough? Well, uh, all the grass hidden to begin with. And as round on the top as possible, the furrow, and as near the size as possible. As I was saying, Ian Arvin today is ploughing at the class at the moment. I'm on his way. He was ploughing at the class this morning. And your instructions are very much where she cut eight inches, I was eight inches of grass you're working with, and you find your own depth. But you're no artificial wheels or anything, you had no wheels, that was your depth control, your shoulders. You did it all, and it was an awful come down to see anybody ploughing with a wheel on. You weren't a fully qualified ploughman, but they started to use wheels on their ploughs. Eventually, the, that went by the way, and everybody used them, but. And but all the playing matches I ever had played it, there was no wheels used. So then I got involved with Logan Football Club. I was secretary. But uh, oh, I'd been known for a while. Did played. you actually play football? Not very much. I did on the bad knee. Always on the bad knee, falling on the shoulder now, on the sand, and it was, it was quite it, it annoyed me quite a lot, and it was really weak. So I never played, I played football sometimes. Not, not for the open, team? Not very often. Uh, but you were secretary of the club? I was secretary for a wee while then. I think it was my cup of food there, a little gardener took over. He lived in the toll house, an old house when it was at the toll. Oh yeah. He took over the secretary. And, uh, Can you remember any members of the team at this time? A going football team. I'll be telling them nearly all. Go on then. David Preston, my Macaulay's father, uh, Anthony Bark, my uncle Jim's Richie's, Hugh Cook, well, uh, Mary's, Willie Cook, Willie Curry, and Jimmy Reid, who was Jimmy Reid, not this Jimmy Reid, oh, he was the brain. And then this Jimmy Reid, Craig Hutton, Alec Muir, John McGaw, and Jimmy Craig, my present Grace Craig's husband. That was the kind of regular team. And where, where did you play? Behind Jimmy Reed's house there. And my which, age, which Jimmy Reed's house? Jimmy Reed's house. Jimmy Reed's house. So at, um, what do they call that house? Thorny. Thorny Cottage. Ah, they played behind it. They played in the field behind up the side of the wood. Oh, yeah. And my uh, age, job as a secretary of the of, uh, Logan Football Club was to go and interview the layout before dinner once a year to get the use of the field to play football in. Oh, yeah, it was always very nice when you went to see him. He never charged you, no? Never charged you to use the oh, field? No, 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 no. No, there was never any charge. But uh, then we eventually we were going to the wardrobe and all these various things stopped. I became a member of the Home Guard and the first time I was called out. It was a long, long time before we ever were told that it was real. We were called out. Mrs. McIntyre, Jim, was putting Jim, not pleasant Jim, to his bed one night and saw white things landing in the bare loose. 
and uh, the home guard was called out. And I was where Sam Reid was in, he was in the Whitley Army, he was on duty at that, and there was a cut of one at the tower at the hill there, on Logan Head. And he, he, he was on home guard duty that night, and I was at home. And when I come, I'd gone down to the hill at Grumpo Den to chase in the rabbits in case somebody had met them while he was on duty here. And when I come home, I told him the home guard had been called out and I was to go to Logan House. And I set off from Logan, from here, in the pitch black dark, with a double barrel gun in my, over my arm, and went to Logan House. And could have been shot by some of the rest of the home guard. But that didn't matter. However, there was nothing very much committed to, went to stand down. And some of them, some of the other members had already got rifles. And when they went to, the, when they were told to stand down, they were standing opposite Chapel Rosen. And Harry Hogg was one, uh, an Ardle member, and we met there. And when he went to take his, they had got their rifles, and he went to unload his rifle, he pulled the trigger and went and through the roof of Chapel Rosen House, the shop. Were these people not really trained how to use the rifles then? No, they had just got them, and we hadn't got them. But, and we got them, I got very much involved in that, but the training and the some machine guns. And, and who trained you? Who trained you? A fella, a fella, wise, Sergeant Wise. And we did have one or two episodes where they were, well, I wouldn't say alarming, but they were quite things that happened. He had a very bad stammer, this fellow wise, and Tom Bark, another uncle of Jim Lynch's, and I went as a sergeant and NCO to weaponry classes in the drill halls on the Villa Road. And this fellow wise was demonstrating how you put a detonator into a 36 hand grenade. And he's standing and he says, and he just plays it like the leg throat and throat in his hand. And he just doesn't put it off, because he only had 30 seconds to do it. And he put it in his hand, and I was quite a furore about that. And I remember the one major pounds, he was, oh, I don't know, they sent Wise away to the borders somewhere. But I think Wise, no, sorry, I've got the wrong name there. Wise was the one that married the housekeeper, the housekeeper of Logan Men's house. That was a fellow gamble that had the very bad stammer. And was he a regular soldier then? He was KOSB. KOSB. He was affiliated to the Home Guard and Pounds and Wise. These, these were the three that were affiliated to train the Home Guard. So, but otherwise, it, it, we never had really anything very exciting. The most exciting bits was when you went to, uh, to judge the other two platoons fighting, maybe because coming was going having a fight, and you were from what you were there as well. And you'd adjudicate that or whatever they call it. <coughs> they were quite, and oh, she had quite good times at all. Then. Well, you, you weren't paid for this? No, no, no. no. no, no a voluntary? No, no. no. Yeah, well, I no choice. I was paid for taking a car. I was paid for taking a car. Oh, you had a car? Mm. And the first, uh, first car I had, I took the. No, before I was going to, we got into West Brook, you see, to try to, try, to train rifle shooting, because the gunner and instructor stayed in. Logan Lodge there. Well, that's Logan Lodge now. That's Sarah oh. Mackay. He was staying in, in Logan Lodge. Well, was it a lodge? Uh, was it a hotel then? No, it was just an ordinary uh, house. It was just an ordinary house, Johnny. So no hotel or no shop or anything attached at that time. Because I don't remember who lived there, but this fellow Mackay and his wife did live in it, well the MOD or the Minister of Defence took it over or not, I can't tell you. But we got into the, frequent for a while we got into the officer's mess after the thing was passed, but somebody put a foot in that and only the officers got into the officer's mess. So we had to go to the ordinary mess if you wanted to think. But <coughs> there was nothing, it was quite something to do and <coughs> we used to have some great carry on with the police over we maybe decide to have a one of the things we did decide to have to, to do was to buy a, a ballistic NASA motor car and she, she biked and this particular nurse Stewart who was the late Mrs Lindsay of Mull she biked from a Matera and the at uh, Port Gela to another one at the Mull twice a day so we decided Logan means the previous Jim McTyre like Jim's father decided we had had a concert, a smokers concert in the hall and it was hilarious. Sir Edward Stewart was there and 
uh, so I looked in Germany to say there was a British grand idea. You never heard anything like in your life. So, unfortunately, that was the next day. I've been smoking again. I've been stopped smoking for about two years. But uh, Jim decided we'd, we'd do this again and gather money and buy the nurse of motor. So we did it in the war. And there was a Hurricane Patrick who lived in Mahardine at that particular time, who was, well, one of the brothers. But this one was just hardly all in one, you know. It was, it was just hardly the full shilling, as they say. And, you know, for the fest, he couldn't help that. But he would sing at this going up to the war when he's go to the 16th best, Jim says, for God's sake, God, he's still over. <laughs> but uh, we did manage to buy a car. Did you? That was great. 120 pounds. And what kind of car was it? A Ford 8. Well, I hope she could drive it then. Oh, I only long enough Stuart could drive the car. Nurse Fife was worse than Nurse Stuart. I'm not sure you say that. Made a prodigy. Did, you, did they have to pass a test in those days? No. I think they were self-starters on them. I was self-starters in the first car I had, and then it was a Ford. Ten. But uh, you also had a starting handle, which was in the boot, and I see the starting handle with that Ford was lying in the dike at the gate there, and then in the garage, yet the starting handle was lying there. An antique. Well. But what about learning to drive? Who taught you to drive? Nobody taught Nobody. me to drive. Jimmy Hogg. <coughs> We left it oil milk, he was, McCormick was left in oil milk at that particular time, and I told Jimmy I bought a motor and would he like to come to Stranard with me for it. So we went to Stranard on the bus, and the head of hell, he said, the motor's yours, and that was my wolf, and I was at a test. That was all the, all the, the, the driving lesson I had. So, and the first, that first car was the one that nearly crashed because McLaren had a lorry broke his back axle in the livery, just below the tool there. And when we reached, we were going to the fruit. Uh, Jim Reed and Ian McPhail and Ian Anderson and I were in the car with me, and this was Trump knew where the car were on. And here we saw these two headlights, you see. So I went to the left and discovered I was in the livery. Uh, the black thing was being towed the wrong way, they were towing backwards because the headlights were in the. <laughs> <laughs> on my side of the road. So, that well, was that. Then we got from there, I think the war, uh, during the war you had all these various organisations like Salute the Soldier and Wings for Victory and then I got involved in the War From Home Fund too. And it was quite a bit of a problem because there was always this question, was he in Cutman when he went to the army or did he come to Cutman, did he spoke come to Cutman after the what, why was this question asked? What difference well, did he make? Well, only if he, he enlisted from Cutmain, did he, and he was entitled to the medal from Cutmain Association, you see. And the one in particular was the Forester's son from Logan, McCree. And they, 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 they argued from three or four meetings over that, that they were at Logan the day before war started. So therefore he was entitled to be, although he'd been called up to somewhere else. He'd been called up for some other place in Scotland. But oh, I fought for about three months over that fellow. I, I went to the of one <laughs> So everybody that came back got a medal? Yes, oh, I, oh, they, they all got them. Uh -huh. And what did the medal say? What did it say on? What did the medal say? Don't you know. don't know. I can't tell you, no. I can't remember. No. What they, what they said. I can't remember who put on the medals. But it'll be... Some of them, and you know, the people will have them. So then, after the, the war kind of died away, I got involved again with playing in the Wakenshire Playing Association, which was open to Scotland. And it was really, a, oh, it was a big one, probably 50 or 60 ploughs at it, and all different horses, tractors, all different vintage ploughing and all these various things. And types of ploughing that I had never seen. Some of these, like, folk from North England come in and did this sort of, Play with a with a sharp top at it. And, and oh, I didn't know there was different types. Oh yes, oh, oh. oh there's a lot of different types, and even yet the top of the pole work, broken work, pin tight. No, but I know it's pin tight now. I'm sorry, and then there's this uh, round top that usually is more practiced here, but not much because structures are too big. Each every one of these structures are taking anything from ten to twelve inches every the time they go. So. <coughs> It was quite an interesting, used to be some quite interesting folk, and I uh, wouldn't stop. 
you know, one of the ploughmen is supposed to touch it or set it up by hand. Only the man that's doing the plough. Well, I used to go to my father was a bit worse than that. But we had one particular episode with that fella, you know, nothing really fell on sight, did it? I know the son. Yes. And the fella McCulloch had bought it. He was ploughing, his son was ploughing, and he would not stop this hand in it. So Ken Henry had one of them two or three times that would pull his pin. Pull his pin? Eh? What does that mean? That was him disqualified. Oh, I see. If he had no number, he had no, he couldn't, he was ah. disqualified. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, we went there and came to the last wee strip. We came along and discovered it was the father was, had the plough and the boy wasn't even there. So Ken just walked up and pulled the pin. So we came to the caravan site, the uh, caravan where they're reading out the prizes, and I don't know if you ever remember Mr. Elder, a banker, in St. Yeah. But he was the secretary then, and Mrs. Elder was setting the prizes, and she was just going in the caravan door, and I'd hand the door, and my colour slammed the door, and blackened those four, four, four nails. I wasn't content with that, but Ken and I were walking out the field and tried to run over us, but we were under one. Ken went to call the air on Monday morning, who did he meet? George McCullough. <laughs> so... That was the, the very much we don't. I went to the retired for that too and just got some other way to do it, but you just got to be you were trying to do too much. So I think the next uh, episode was the when they put me onto the education subcommittee. It was very interesting when you got involved in education and in these days it's when I was coming in with. What, what time of year, what time are you talking about now? What date are we at now? Covered quite a few years. Well, I would say 65 to about 72, I think. Right. And they were coming in with the, the free clothing at that particular time, and Stonard Academy was just being opened, so you can tell them when it Ah, when it opened. Yes, it was 60s something. Ah. Mm. Early and 60s, I thought, but. Um. The, the, the headmaster was uh, going to have everybody in uniform, and some of the very difficult cases were where you got maybe. Two girls into one poor family, or three girls into one poor family, or three children into one poor family, coming in to Sonar Academy, and oh, there was quite debates, you know, like John Devon and David Mahar, Senior David Mahar, Ian McMaster. They were quite, let's say, they were older than me, but they were far more dull. Uh, sort of, they didn't want to give anything away for nothing. And funny enough, I got over it very easily that uh, this lady from Glenlis, she had two daughters going to Sonar Academy and they would not give her blazers and skirts, they would give her shoes and stockings and a blouse or something, but blazers and skirts was out. And I said that you've already, psychologically, if you've beaten those two girls right away, because all the rest of the class are sitting in uniforms and they are not. So, all well, that was all right, then they decided, well, well, they make it, uh, and they'll have a in the centre to check. And I said, you sent her what? Sent her a check. I said, surely not. Yes, why, in what way? I said, the check would never be spent on the uniforms at all. Because I just heard before that from the chairman that she didn't over indulgence for gin. <laughs> and they were actually handing out the check to the parent. But we got that, I got that changed. I had to get it changed as it went to Ireland and be equitable or some of the drapers or something like that. The money went to them as, as a doctor. Mm. And the, that was the way that they worked it out later on. So, so this was a clothing allowance for school uniforms that no longer exists, is it? No, I don't think so. Yeah. She's just starting, starting a protest that they don't want to wear uniforms at all. <laughs> so that was... Oh, the, 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 the education subcommittee was very, very interesting. You know. <laughs> Sometimes when you had two two or three parents up because the children went out of school and this was one of the wonderful excuses, you know. One lady told us she had written five times to the headmaster and they never replied. <laughs> so, but then we got back to the calling then, being a, I was a, a Logan member of the Lindsay Galloway province. And, uh, was that the title of the club? Pardon? Rins of Galloway Province, is that the title of the club? No, it's the title of the five or six clubs in the Rins of Galloway. All right. That's like all the clubs in the Rins of Galloway are the province. Mm -hmm. you know, and uh, 
I had the honour of being the president at the Rogan Cullen Club at the centenary when they were 100 years old. And it was, it was quite good. And uh, my idea, how I collected the money for that was I'd asked all the members to give me a bill card once a year. And I sold the bill card and collected 500 bill cards for about five years and collected 540 pounds. So we managed to pay for the dinner. Couldn't do it now, but <laughs> you could then. And oh, it, it was a great success. Um, and where was the dinner? No, I no mm-hmm. um, What always interests me about Logan Curling Club is how they ever manage to curl outdoors. Because I've never seen Logan Pond frozen hard. The last time they curled outdoors was in 63. But did they do it regularly before? No, according you know. to the ice, John, it's only according to the amount of ice you were getting, 63 and... But when you say Logan Curling Club was a hundred years old, mm. had they been curling outdoors in that hundred years on a regular basis? Oh, no, 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 no. You see, you could curl at New Loose, but you couldn't curl anywhere else. Where at New Loose? New Loose had got a higher percentage of a greater, uh, they got a greater catch of hard frost and never we go, and the weather lock was, was uh, set in a sort of, built-in sides, no, it wasn't really built-in, but those like higher sides. Yeah, and, uh, in the valley, more or less. It, it was uh, really the one that you would call it New Lewis, probably the only place you would call it in a whole year would be New Lewis. But in 1963, 63, I think, we called every club in the province, but Pathic, uh, so where are these curling ponds and these other places? Well, they're all, I think they're all presented. You see, the curling pond, there isn't a curling pond that Logan was across the road for the, for the lodge, for the Logan, where Norman lived, Logan Court. Mm-hmm. It was in the wood, there isn't yeah. a curling pond, it was in the wood. And then we curled in the, the one in, in, in Balcari, in the... Uh, you know, down the road, your, your road down. Yes, you look across to it from and that, and, from the drum. And then, the last one in Curland was the big one on Bulcaria Road, sir. The big dam. That was the last one. But we played... I think we must have played four or five different clubs in that, in a week. Uh, here, Alison was born, I know. Uh, so that was 63. And... Um, I know you, and then we curled one day at... Uh, to Fechla. Where's that? At Christmas Eve. And it was like Logan Gardens in the mid warmest day in summer. Mm-hmm. We sat outside in the bank and had a lunch in the bank and we had jackets off and it was a marvellous. Ross Cohen had a, a lot of shorts at that, but I don't know whether John or Strad had them or not. And where was this loch? Fechla. Fechla. Where's that? Uh, near Kirkhoun. Oh. One on either side of the, of the Kirkhoun Wicken Road. You know, if you get through. Turn off to go to Wickham and Kirkcow and yeah. yonder. There's one on the right and one on the left. And we were on the one on the right in near the Clayton Home Farm. It was, and it was a marvellous day. It was to be on Christmas Eve. So and were these ponds naturally formed? They weren't they man-made, were they? Were they? they were kept clean. They cleaned them out. You know, it was a sort of yearly event at Logan and they cleaned the curling pond once a year. And then eventually when it got so bad, Logan Men's and I went down one Sunday morning and went down through it and we found there six or seven pairs of curling stones that had been lost through the ice. And uh, in fact, I have a pair of claws yet that came that way. Were there ever any tragedies, people? No? The only one I know, I don't know. Well, somebody went through the ice, I don't know, but that's the only one. Uh, my father was there, I went in a at the time, which was up on the, on the, on the, on the shore. And uh, they'd been calling her, no, and somebody went through the ice, no, but that's the only one I ever heard of. There was a lot of ropes there all the time, so you never thought it was out then. Yeah. See, we went on to Craigler that first time I went, John McComb, Ewan McLeod, and Alec McLeod from Inchanks, and I went to call for, for Rogan at Craigler, and John and I stood in the bank and counted. There was 42 tons on that ice, counting colored stones and men. I was taking the men into the trial to 13 stone. And, and the How did you test if the ice was thick enough? Well, they boarded it, you know, mm. 
Now the thing about going out, and you only get on unless you'd five and a half to six inches ice anyway. And uh, it used to be, you know, terribly scared of cracking ice, but cracking ice is very safe ice. If it's cracking, if you hear it cracking, it's very safe. It's the dead ice that would go, you know, a bit of four way to the dead ice, but it's, uh, that was what was on that Chrysler Dam that day, mm. 42 ton. So when was the um, curling rink at the North West Castle opened? I mean that as well, but I can't tell. <laughs> I should know because I was at the opening, I was the, I was the Logan member at the opening. I was the, the founder member of the Iceland. And in fact, that uh, whenever the thing was lost, Gene and I came into the North West Castle one day having a lunch. And Hammy was walking about chewing cigars and I said, what's wrong, Hammy? Opening in October, he said, and this is the end of July, and that the refrigeration company have gone bust, and the men have been strike because they've gone bust, and we can't get the plant released. And I said, "What company is that?" And he told me, and I said, "Oh, wait a minute, I think I know something about this." So I come home and I phoned a friend, uh, well, a friend of mine, but a friend of Jean's. He was a certain clerk in Shadows and Cap. And he was with this particular company, so I can't remember the name of it yeah. at the moment. But I phoned on the white that night, and I had I was at a, an education meeting on the Monday night, and I was telling him, I told him he was to phone all on white and gave him the number, and they got the refrigeration plant that way. That's how they got it. But they sent an awful lot of cowboys to put it in. They an awful lot of bother after it went in. Hey, but it was open in time, and did get it opened in time, but. There was an awful lot of work to do with it after that. Was that the first one ever to be in the area? You know, uh, well, no, I was the first yeah. one, I. Castle was the first one, no. But I was ever in. Here, here, Castle. And Edinburgh. I'm curling all these ones. Curling quite a lot in there. We all curled in there. I mean, for the, before we go to the bar. And I can always remember going into that meeting and when we were asked to see how much money we could collect to build a nice thing in Stranraer. And I went in like a dog with two tails. I had about twelve hundred and fifty pounds of a logan. From people who were wanting people to claim. People who were willing to put money into it. And I eh, everybody announced what they got and I was nearly last and I said, Well, I've got twelve hundred and fifty pounds. <laughs> Folk are beginning to win and Corrid I says, Well, if you allow me to speak, I mean eh, H C McMillan would like to build it himself. So it's like well in the pools. I don't know why they called it up, but that's what I said that night. <coughs> so, but he, he did get it started and he made a very good job at the And he, he, he was very, very keen at it, you know. He really took a great interest in it. But Alan White certainly had to it for that whole was lost. I can't remember the name of the company that, that was called. It. So that uh, sort of was my episode in the curling. However, I had a great spell as a boarder too. And uh, I was president of the Sandhead Bowling Club for about eight years and eventually got on and became Wakensup president, which is a great, that's a great experience to be president of Wakensup Bowling Association because you meet bowlers from all over Scotland and probably the North England too. And uh, oh, some of the, and you get the privilege of going to the big finals, the Scottish finals at Queen's Park, which are not at Queen's Park now, they're in air, but mm-hmm. they weren't at Queen's Park these days. And when we went back, to, when I went back to Queen's Park, meeting the fellas you had met on tour, who had been with you on tour maybe a year or two years before, and one guy sitting on the top of the gate post, I don't know what he was doing from now and then, but whether he was up there for amusement or whether he was surveying, I don't know, but the first thing I heard was Stuart Sonhead. <laughs> <laughs> this was a fellow to Edinburgh. <coughs> and Queen's Park's in Glasgow, was it, Jimmy? Yes, so uh-huh. I had Queen's Park's in Glasgow, and it was played there always. Up to about three years ago, Johnny's, but they've come to here now. I don't know why they've come to here, but uh, it was great. It was a great experience to be there. You know, you went with a, you started with a with a Wakefield Wakefield bowling team. Uh, you had five different venues you went to each year playing in this Maxwell Trophy, and oh, you met some wonderful fellas. Why did you play for Sandhead? Was there not a bowling green in Dromore at that time? Well, the McLean took me to Sandhead. Ah. And he was a criminal manager at Sandhead. Uh-huh. Now, my first experience, I went to Dromore, actually. But you had to be ready to, to bowl at 7 o'clock, not could you? No. 
I went twice. Still the same. Do you more after a, after a, is it? Well. You, you recorded that. <laughs> uh, after I joined, I joined the more and went twice. And, no, they didn't want to know me. And that was him. That couldn't have been there before. That. No. So I went to Sean Head. I was in Long Air, I was present, and then just went for the FT, I was present the week and so But it, it was a marvellous experience. You meet tremendous, I mean, a tremendous lot of people. So, that was uh, things as far as we're going. What do you want in your notes now? Um. I don't know, maybe it was. No. Uh, co Maiden Community Council, oh, Jimmy. Yeah, oh, something we have missed out on here that you've got jotted down is evacuees. I know that's oh, going back yes. in time a bit, but maybe we will oh, cover we'll that. Back to that a bit. Yes, can we go back to evacuees? Just carry on, to Yes, just, just, just come back. Oh, well, uh, there's another job I got to go on for a billeting officer in, during the war, and uh, I'd gone to the, I'd gone to the, I'd gone to land, the police are now. Volunteer, but when they asked my father's name, or who was at home, and I told them my father's age, or they told me to go home. Most of them I was sent home. So I got on a civilian officer under, well, Alexander Middley, who was the county sanitary inspector in these days, and Mr. Vernon, who was in, employed by Richard County Council, who was stone deaf. I don't know whether you know the family or not, but organ makers and Newton Stewart, I yeah. And uh, it was very easy work when I went. It was a wee bit difficult. Some of the evacuees were a wee bit difficult. Not one load, I think, was the one, and that was in the lodge. Where did they come from? They were from Gordon's, that first load came from Scotland Street in Glasgow, the first load. And they came in, in October. How many? Uh, I think the first load was 16. 16 and uh, they came and there was uh, three billeted in Nelly Hutton who's just going away to you know the old lady along here at the end she was in the lodge then they had the lodge and I was at a farm there my father and I and when I come home they told me Nelly or Jean Hutton come up for me her sister and I went down to see this and I never saw anything in my life Charles. they thought that the bath was for keeping the cold in but the bed was a bed was a place where you put dead folk. But the toilet could be done anywhere. Didn't matter where you did it. You know what was dreadful. And uh, so I said to Jean Hutton, I said, You got a fine tooth comb, Jean. You know, they're supposed to go all the lows to pull the cave in you. No, after I was falling the toilet bed. So I was in a Friday afternoon and on the Monday morning I packed them into the car, took them into the station. Notified the billet noise on bus seat and glass it on our way home for the other days. And they told me over the phone I'd no right to send them home and I says, You're getting them home and you can have a look at them when you get them and I used to billet and wanted to pay their ticket. So I, I sent them home. But <coughs> the rest were too bad. And I was telling them were here for quite a long time, they were here for two or three years some of them. And uh, and why were they in the lodge? Was that because it was... Oh, they were about, you know, billeted into the lodge, you know. You billeted into the public that wanted to take them. Ah. Uh, see, uh, there was two in here next door. And you were paid a certain amount? Well, they get paid so much. All right, they got a billet and allowance which they had to cost themselves. The only one that there was one in the uh, cottage over there at, uh, at uh, Fishbourne, the cottage, not the Fishbourne house. And they made his billet, and obviously it was Alex Stewart, not... And his billet now was James Hurt. It was the wrong way around. And Miss Gulliver would not, would not uh, cast the billet now because when he made it, uh, it made it my name after And I had to go to Glasgow a lot, and I had an allardyce now. I had a stand up fight over these three that I sent home. And they told me I was contravening uh, something in the element or something by sending them home. And, uh, oh, we're having a son. I said, well, I'm sorry, Mr. Lardyce, but nobody would allow you on children. No fault of the children. I said, that the fault, the, the conditions from which they'll come out, nobody would keep you on folk in their house. And the door opened. And this man came in and he said, what's, what's the matter? What's the raised voices about? 
Oh, well, I says, I'm sorry if you heard what I was saying, and I looked at him and I went, oh, no, you. And uh, so he said, what was it with Mother? Mother and I started telling him and who I was. And, Come at Port Logan, he says. And he says, yes. You were a sister, was at Port Logan's school, hadn't you? And I said, I had. She was pretty able, pretty clever. And I said, is that Nana you're talking about? That Nana, that's Nana. Anna Stewart, he says, not Nana Anna. That's right. I'm just calling the and I've been out of education officer here for years. And I remember Nana. Nana? Really? Well, that was quite quiet. I could be scared. Nothing more done about it. But we have one comes yet. We have one who lives back east. Oh. He was at my party in Trustwater. Mm -hmm. And he comes from the Southern Islands. Oh, yes, I've heard you speak Wallace. of him. Uh -huh. mm. You see him in Nana's house. Right? I think I have met mm. him, yes. So he came back. And you know, two or three, one in the Canadian Mountain Police has come back. And one in the Ports of the Lord, with some firm in Paisley, he came back, he was a regiment. He was one of the very first ones. The last lot that we had, we got them in three stages, and the last lot was in May of 1941. <coughs> and I was working Mr. McCall the late Mr. McCall McGarrity and the late John Harry Berry, the factor that Logan said they could work on themselves. I didn't need to come and I was and then turn up from the roadside up the road there. And at three o'clock, Miss Galloway, who used to have the wee shop down there in the village, Miss Ellen Galloway, she came for me and said, I need to come down. She says, it's absolutely... The horse is here. I can't do much about it. She says, could, you, could I go and ask your father to come for the horses? And I said, oh, well, you can never do that. And I went and did a bit and they go down, Johnny's. There was the original ring of the Vakis, the first lord, and the locals. There was the next lot and a few more locals in the mid and next wing, and there was these seven, seven, sitting in the centre, weeping their eyes out, and the, these two men didn't know what to do with them. So I knew exactly where they were all going. I what was what was the problem? What house did they send them to? Oh, where did they send these? Who was to take them? Well, I knew that Ina Cook was taken to the cabin. Annie Hutton was taken to Logan Court. She lived in Logan Court at the time. That was four away. I was left with a single one, which I thought I was nearly certain that this lady next door would take was one of hers was away. Who was next door? No, Hutton, she was in these days. She was an old lady that lived. All my lifetime she'd be there. She'd be my. She'd nurse me when I was born. Like. No, she wouldn't. Because her daughter was six, six days younger than me. <laughs> anyway, when I went down, they didn't know what to do with them, so I had them all sorted out. But I had two for a Mrs. McConnell in the house where McGavigan is now. And these particular two, I took them with me. The rest were all sent relative to and then took them. He delivered them. He knew where they were going. And when I took the mission of corner, she says, I wouldn't allow these children into my house. I says, why? She says, my husband was killing me if I allowed them. They're absolutely filthy. So I went up to for Jim and says now, and Mrs. Douglas Laird, who's the teacher in Port Logan at that particular time, was there. And I said to her, would you take these two girls to sort them out, Jane? Certainly, she said she would take them. These two girls are still here. Mm -hmm. You know Joe Rothman and the Coleman? Mm -hmm. That's his mother. Really? Mother. Really? Uh huh. Mary. Uh -huh. And uh, the other one, I don't know what her name is. But I see Mary often, quite often. And they were just young children at this time when they came? Oh, I do. Mary, they were only about 10, 11 then. But they never went home. Mm. Mary went to, they went to Mrs. McCulloch and Cardrain on the Sunday, on the Saturday morning. And never left it. They were married from Cardrain. <coughs> so that was their back. He's, but, they were, they were terribly keen to, to work, to help you. And I remember two wee English girls, one of them, I don't think they were back these anyway, but they just stayed in one of the houses down there on the port, and they came from Manchester. And I went to meet these Ned Turnips in the snow. Well, they, were, they were great wee folk workers. Very, a lot of them were very keen. They, uh, they were very keen on animals, that was what they'd never mm. seen animals. No. We always remember North Skira. She was a district nurse at the time. And we went, we were to go to the war in case there was an overflow, in case we had to bring some. The nurse care was on, going on in this fine 
tyht kuum ja mun kuumen väärässä vaan selvä että den gai het kommer men det svårare möten vi dat ni har finished oss if you take a hundred yard pokers and get a cool and get in and help me say <laughs> <laughs> so but uh, that was the back is and oh. what about prisoners of war did you have yes, any so feelings for those a lot, quite a lot of prisoners of war in fact two of them as far worked for me in the first place ever they worked after they came here and there was an SS man mm. I see him quite often he was well in the hammer for a long time in the flood but uh, I see Joe quite open. In fact, that day Jim Ritchie got his long service medal at the show. When I come out the ring, Mary Stoke man says, you billeted me in 1941. <coughs> but uh, I, I would have known who she was because I knew, I knew him, I knew who he was. So, uh, and then someone else well, that used to work in the squads uh, said, you don't remember me, but I, had, I, couldn't, I couldn't get hurt, but I go to event here, but she don't know who she was, she knew who she was. So the prisoners of war, were they... Yeah, uh, both Italians and Germans. Uh-huh. Well, the Germans were far the best. We had two very regular, who were staying in, in billets in the local gay field yonder, just stood below class winning. On well, the field before you go to class winning. The dark was land girl. We had land girls first, of course. Uh, quite a lot of land girls. Uh-huh. Quite a lot of very good land girls. You'd hardly believe they were so good from quite a... CNA in Glasgow and right. Tellings and... This was the job they were given for the war? Oh, oh, uh, uh, in fact, uh, Mrs. M- well, first Mrs. McKitty, the client, was a land girl. When she worked in, I think, CNA. And there was a family, there was two girls, O'Neill, they were Catholics, but there was a big family of them, there was five or six of them. Family, but there was two of them here in the land army. But they were very, very good, and very, very willing. There was a girl, but Patrick was just about as good as I am. Right now, no. To wait a moment. But uh, the girl I walked along with her was a W.D. Wills, W. and H.O.D. Wills factory in Glasgow, cigarette factory. Oh, yeah. And I remember once going into McDonald's, the barber shop in McDonald's, and walking up, back up the floor to come to the door, and I met a land girl that had been in the class. Uh, I don't ask me the name, I can't even remember them, but uh, then after the land girls went away, we got these we Germans first, and we had a pair of little talkers. Oh, that was great. Louis and Greg, Victor and Louis. And Victor, after he went to Newton Stewart, you had to get brother to Newton Stewart eventually. Victor asked if he could get to the class every time he wanted to. What could he get to the class? Then they'd come. But I remember the first time Jean was ever here. We went night before she went away. We went to Bobby Reed for honey, and we met Victor coming up past Peggy Hutton's door, Peggy, no, Annette Torbett's door, on a bike. And I stopped. And I said, "Where are you going? I'm going to the class to see your mother." And the Louis had gone away home with us. Then. I just had a letter from Louis, and I was to tell your mother he was very full of grapes. <laughs> But they never came in, up into the class court in the morning, which sheep were then, which wasn't the hours, so they broke into your tunnels. They both of them went and put all these sheep out before they ever come near me in the morning. Oh, they were, they were great. And then, but the next lot, when we were putting in the water, they wouldn't get the, they wouldn't get the whole world digging the water tank. They were frightened they'd collapse in the top. Uh-huh. But I just sent them home and told them they didn't, didn't do it, I told them no use to me. And we got a tower. Where were these uh, prin- prisoners of war billeted? In the in the billets in uh, in Jamore. In your in Cla in Lokergy Field. Oh Lokergy. Well the billets were in Lokergy Field. They followed the land girls. And then we got Italians. No, they were a they were a different lot of you had to watch. They were even they even stole sheets of corrugated iron and took it away. <laughs> now they were a different lot of guys. But one that made me a cigarette later out a cottage case. You know, uh, a bullet cartridge case and they were very they were very good hands really these some of them but the Germans were the best how long did they stay then? I don't know if you could tell the Germans when they switched over most but uh, see the Italians got to be when there was some who could get out and some couldn't if you were a collaborator 
you could get out, but if you're only if you're still anti British, you got a big black patch on that on the uniform. Between their shoulders, they knew, you knew what was what then. That was the Italians. But uh, then we had the uh, Lithuanians after that. And uh, we had two of them for quite a long time. But one of them got his list broken. Uh, and that meant a load of turnips. And he took the pen suit. And uh, the door came down and hit him in the wrist and broke his list. But he went and they finished at Kielnus. He died in Kielnus. And she kept house, but they had no English at all. Very, very little. If she phoned, if I tried, if I tried to phone William John Leroy and Kovalevsky used to call them answer the phone. Boss not to home. That was all he got. Mm -hmm. <coughs> but he was very, very good worker. They were very good workers. And his wife was, she kept house. She once annoyed Mr. Leroy very intently in a power cut. And he wanted to ask the cooker. And they were thrashing the mill was in, and he wanted to ask the cooker. And he then said, Nina, cooker. I'd be like the one boss. So at that time, and, and cooker still working on him, she still was saying, I'd be like the one boss. <laughs> so that, I scrapped in a lot of it. But, uh, no, they were, they, they, well, I used to send them, or some of the girls sent them a cup of tea in the afternoon. They were left in there, and they were left in there, and they were working with it. Worked away and ate a piece of one hand, kept on working. One of them, actually, if he couldn't get anything to do, he went and got a bush and swept the court. He swept it twice a day, so it was working. And they were the Lithuanians, these two. But I've come through a great big revolution, and I have come through a great big revolution in, in farming altogether. Mm -hmm. And you would hardly believe it. Now, I dare say, well, even my father would hardly believe that you go down and cut hay and in three days you could put it into bales instead of putting it into ricks and cutting it in loose. And mm -hmm. It was quite a revolution, which I don't know how it's done any good on Well, it's put a lot of people out of work, hasn't it's it? Just, uh, technology has done, Janice. Technology's mm -hmm. put a lot of folk out of work. Mm -hmm. Now, Maiden Community Council, Jimmy, you've also been involved in. Mm -hmm. Was that from the onset? I was on the steering committee. When was that? That would be... Robert was... 20 years ago. Uh-huh. Robert was 16. And he, he was uh, there at the steering committee meeting. And it was Dr. Hawken, Dr. Stephen, the old man Copeland, and it was Neil Christ up next Oh, yes, him. yes. Maiden. Mrs. Bull and I were the steering committee appointed at an open oh, meeting. We were the steering committee. And I was appointed chairman of the steering committee at that open oh, meeting. <coughs> Barry Stewart was there. He was the organiser of that, he was the district council. And uh, the first steering committee meeting, I was 16. And he wanted a, mo a moped, which his mother wasn't very keen on, but however, we decided to get him a moped, and it was the first day of August. So Robert and I went to off for the moped, couldn't get into the bank to get the money, and couldn't get the thing last night anyway, because it was a bank holiday. I came home, and I was getting ready to go to the steering committee meeting when Mrs. Brook came to the door and said Robert had gone into their car and go then. And Robert ran into the water on a push bike and did £180 for the damage to the water. Now that was how long I did ago, Robert was 16. Now that was the start of the, ste the steering committee. So the steering committee drew up the, the constitution of the whole thing. And I'm very proud to say that D.R. Wilson edited the whole thing and only altered one bit. Mm. But the local councillor had no right to enter a community council meeting unless invited to do so. And that was all. Was the only Did he put that in or take that out? He put that in. In. I oh, know, because we had not lot in, but he put it in. So I'm not saying any more about steering committees, because I was amazed on a steering committee that we had one doctor and one teacher who should have known an awful lot, didn't know very much. Well, they're only constitution-wise, mm. they had no idea. Mm. So the current went from there to there, but I think the... the 
The high date of the community occurrence was what? The Silver Jubilee, 1952. Ah, that was the Jubilee. I think that was the high date. 1977. All the kids got medals and. Uh, so I've got a lot of help for that because my brother-in-law got all the medals for me. And this is uh, your brother-in-law that's the jeweller? No, I was. What is on? So he did everything for us. No, it was the, they got the, the crown it was to go, the five shilling piece stamped. That's what they got. Oh, yeah. And uh, so Wallace got all that done for us and uh, then the bonfire, it was that was the only thing I had any real bother with. The bonfire, where was it? Well, the old War Memorial used to be, do you know where the War Memorial used to be? In Cat Maiden? Mm-hmm. You know, if you go up the school road, Johnny, the steps up to the old yes. War before you go. Yes, yes. That's where the... So, the, the, the flat bit at the back was where the, the bonfire was. And, I mean, we had to bring in outside us because, well, let's say that no, but the community council was, you know, very good, but they were getting on in years the most of them, they were, and brought in Bob Barnes and some, there was four of us that were really involved in the setting up of the bonfire, with all the bonfire, what a car I all had with the bonfire. Oh, and a, 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 a person you know very well. You see, it was in chain. It, mm. We could not light until the uh, one at uh, out of which one was lit. Oh, ahead. I see. One right. ahead. Yes. But we were not and in could you chain. see it? Could you see it from? Yes. Oh, we could see it quite in here. But we were not in the chain because the next one was still on Stonica. We were. We only t- we tried to get into the chain. So eventually, when we got. And sort of things sorted out and everything. <coughs> I phoned Robert Clark, you know who the man you know very well. Mm-hmm. Robert Clark told me I had to phone somebody in Fries. I phoned somebody in Fries, they told me I had to phone somebody in Edinburgh. I phoned somebody in Edinburgh and they told me that they would get the man that I was in Edinburgh and they would tell me how the chain worked and if I'd explain to them where the position of the bonfire was. But what a job I had getting them. Could run in, but the bar ahead they could work me. And I said, well, we would be the one after, but ahead. And who told you to phone me? Well, I went back down the line, and I says, and where did you stop? I said, I started with Robert Clark, Mr. Norwell. He says, he could have told you without you coming any further. <laughs> and I phoned back to Robert, and I had a year of that. But I wanted the road closed anyway, so I couldn't say too much to him. So I got the road closed, you know, no traffic, and then the school road. Uh-huh. So and what time of year was this bonfire lit? Sure, that's the date. No, uh, date, no. no, there's not a date on, on this. This is um, the Silver Jubilee. The 2nd of June. Royal Map of Successions. Hmm? Does it give you the date on here? Maybe it does. Uh, the 2nd of June, the anyway, because June. that was the coronation. And was it a good night? Oh, it was great. Clear? Oh, yeah. Oh, it was great. I finished up a fight and crashed one. Everybody went. Was that planned or spontaneous? Oh, it was the time Mr. Anders tried to send Stan in orders. He was, at, he was on the community council. And he was at this meeting. Oh, I said, Oh, you're jail, oh, you're the jail, that's going to happen on the tape. <laughs> <coughs> and he didn't want the dancing class for him. And why did the community stand on him? I said, A lot of folk don't like going upstairs to a dance anyway. And I said, oh, You were here when that decision was taken anyway, Mr. Anders, so whatever the other body was. So I went to class one and everything was fine. And Jean and Alice and I were standing down in the bottom corner, right down the far away corner. And I saw there was a fighter one. And it was a fella Craig and what kind of went in And I just left him standing and Burns and I got the hold of him and put him down into the flat bit of the hall and put him away for the other end. And Wallen says I can back up this hey, what people Burns and I tell you been fought now off you know. Wallen says I can back up this stair, I said, I'll put him back down. Then he went up to that and climbed up over the top of the balcony and out of her and stepped and Mrs. Hose's feet as he was going past and Mark with the other one was going go for him and then he, he busted through the front door and Graham when Roy got him across the throat pulled him up and had to tell him Graham to let him go he's going to kill him you know I had him like that no I can't even make that again most of honest but that was I just kind of did the guilt off the ginger bread that night yeah there's mm. always something to spoil mm. an event so 
what about um, the community council were involved with the rebuilding of the uh, pier? Oh, oh yes, it's, uh, uh, not too long time. Too Tell long us a bit time. about that. And uh, I think eventually we discovered that Port William and doing it, and Price and I went to a meeting of the <coughs> oh, fucking charge of the, on the building there. Quite a of years. At Port William, and we went to meet you in the in the hotel at Port William to meet this particular man, and he was the one that didn't turn up. Well, two were there, and there was a fellow, you know, the one before Pierce on the on the on the community count on the oh no the thing they brought to, to get employment for the. Oh, like employment training as it is oh, now. Well, that's what they call it, challenge. Anyway, well, the first youth? job we did get done was the doctors, the sort of the football. Ah, uh-huh. like the, the youth employment. The youth employment, is that oh, that's it. Yeah. And uh, the, we got that footpath led to doctor surgery, oh, and yes. then we got involved in the middle and inside the Capitol on them. Mhm. And uh, what was belonged to Andy and what belonged to yeah, and Chica. that uh-huh. and that was split in two. But I was at that meeting when the clerk who worked for years, Barbara Convener, and the minister were to meet me at 7 o'clock and the both came at a quarter to eight. So I was a wee bit chuffed to start to begin with. But anyway, we got that done and then they did the Port Logan Hall outside. Mm-hmm. Uh, Ian Gardner was in charge then and he was the grocer's son for the war. <coughs> so then we started to work on this ski that the, the lighthouse was going to collapse because it was all on their mind. And I think in 1975, I started to think about getting that key sorted. Mm-hmm. So eventually it got to the stage where we were getting nowhere, and Price and I decided to go to this meeting in Port William, and we met not the one we wanted to meet, but we met other two who said they would report back to him. And the, the former less youth employment committee met the doctor and I at the hall one day and told us we didn't have a hope. What, of getting money? Getting anything, getting anything done. And I said, well, I've already seen two gentlemen who have promised to come and look at this, and they are the quantities of heirs at Port William. And I said, you have a hope? I said, oh, hopeful, I'm very hopeful. And I was coming up here one day when I saw them on the quay. So I went and interviewed them, and it was the first time I ever found out that the, the original key didn't sit on the... The original key's a different key for the other one. Oh. It's further out. And it was dead low water giants and as clear as crystal. And we could see the foundations of the old key. Really? And wh- when you say further out, further out to sea? Further out to sea. Not a lot, but it's further out than that, uh, that closer thing now. Oh. And so you never knew that? No, I never knew it. I never knew it either. And I was never been out of all that's but here. <coughs> but anyway, the, they decided that there was something that could be done. So they, through, I don't know what organisation through, but they got in touch with Barr, and Barr arrived here one Thursday morning with two of these great big diggers, and went on to the top of the banquet and levelled their way onto the top of the stones at this end of the quay. And Les McCray's husband, the fellow left to a now, was one of these d- drivers, or these tankers, or these... Uh, Diggers, JCBs, I wonder if JCBs and big ones. But anyway, they built that wall in again into the place and Bart brought the cement and they on the cement in, poured the cement in as a building. Very shortly after that, I was in the district council office talking to Barry Stewart. And Alec Hart would come in, who's the deputy convener of the district council, next in line to Alistair Geddes. And he said, and he said, I'm sorry, Jimmy, we can't get on anything with your key. So I'm very pleased to tell you, I it's been done. He never, they never even notified the county council they were doing it. So then, I was asked to go in and see Alistair then. So Alec and I went back into Alistair's office. And Alistair says, we're thinking about doing something else at Port Robert. Now what were you thinking? And he was on this picnic area that had made it stay here. How they had, oh, yeah. was, this, this was his work of art. And he says, well, we think we'll make you a picnic area. And I says, where are you going to work? What are you going to do it? All along these benches, he says, oh, no. I says, no, you're not. 
Why is it? Because it's a midget you move that bent. The whole of that sand is going to get into the sea, and you're in no way. It's only the bent that's keeping the sand together. What do you mean by a bent? That bent the grass that's running along the running along the school road there between and the shore. That kind of bent the sharp grass that. Oh, that's what you call bent. That's bent. Mm-hmm. So he said, "What do you think?" No, I said, "Put a bit of bit for the hall along to call you." You're going to make the course with you, but he says, when he made the course with you, no, but I says, when you made the course we made, that this time they told me they were going to do something, but I had no idea they were going to be as elaborate as they were. However, they did that, and when the course we built, they came back at me again. In fact, they came to class one day and said, would you like to show me what you're talking about? So I showed him, and I said, why no, make a picnic here, if you hear wrong, here, of course we. And that's what they did. Mm-hmm. So. Very nice too. And it was in for some award, Jimmy. Pardon? It was recommended for some award, wasn't it? Yes, I, I was invited to that, but then I didn't go. I in, Can you remember what it was called? It was the... Um, Jimmy Reed got it. Eyebright scheme, was it? No. They were, they were what, second? Mm. What was the name of the thing? Was it the Eyebright, or...? Oh, I couldn't tell you. Giles, I can't tell you the name of it. But I was invited to it, and mm. it was presented by. Oh! It was for improvements, wasn't it? To yes, oh, I. And, uh, villages. Uh, Jimmy Reed and. All right, we'll see the one. From here to. Was it Edinburgh they went to? Mm, I believe it was. Mm-hmm. You can't remember what scheme it was. No, I'm not. Anyway, it came second, didn't it? It was second, yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, it got the uh, second award. Mm-hmm. But they made a very good job of that when they did it. And, you know, all these courses had came from Paisley. Now, it was all done by hand. All that bit was paved by hand, right down to the yes. key. Yeah. The, orig- the beacon on the end, or the, the lighthouse as it's known, which isn't really a lighthouse. No, it never was. No. It's, it's too far off the shipping route, you see. It was too far in. But there's a, there's a Wallace and uh, Steve Waterman who, well, his wife was her bridesmaid. They both have shots of it. The sun's set and taken right through the hole and you'd, you'd feel mm. the light in it. Mm-hmm. Wallace is a very good one. You'd feel the Why light. was it built then if it was not to be a lighthouse? Or, I mean, did, was there a beacon in it? I don't know. Actually, it's not like it's Seems that Who was uh, architect? Oh, he's very famous architect. I remember Fiona. I think it was Fiona coming home from the academy one night and she said to me, Who went to school road, Dad? And I said, Tell him I kind of No, no, she said it was I don't know say this because I'll be, I'll be wrong. Mm. One of the very famous, you know, his bridge building, I don't know him. You've got to know about the bridge. Not Stevenson? No, no. I was thinking on Todd, but it was just Todd. Mm. He bent the road from Port Party to Carlisle at seven pounds a mile. Mm. Well, that's the first coach road from Papa to Carlisle, of course, £7 a mile. That's one mile. And he, he's supposed to build this? He built them, like he here on the Cape, Papa to uh-huh. And do you know a date for that? You don't know how old the original key was? Oh, I don't no. know, I couldn't give you a, uh, an absolute date for no. it. But I have heard, you know, that it's somewhere about 1835. And that was originally done, and then I tried to make it the short sea route to Ireland, but it didn't work there. But even in the worst time, they brought cattle ashore here, but they had to swim them ashore. Oh. So they put them off the boat out and, and swam them ashore. Uh-huh. Well, it was put too the on the first one, and the rest followed. Yeah. So I mean, my mother could tell me that bit. What about the Waybridge that's down there? 
Do you know anything about that? No, well, that was for when the Logan Corps used to do that. It was all the Corps of the Logan Estate come in and screw us up there on the sands, you know, and then beside the quay. They were always out on the shore, and then uh, it was a great sight to see the maybe eight carts for Logan men from the three of a brick coming down the, go down the bottom there about five o'clock in the morning in the month of May, and they were all, all painted up in the hall, and they were all clean because the last of the spring work was finished. It was a great sight, that. And they would cut coals for maybe two, two and a half days before they would empty it. Oh? And they always had, uh, every man had two horses, two carts. <coughs> and they brought them up and weed them there, but they always had a horse that pulled the, the, the cart up the, past the whole bit. They had a tracer, what they tell them, the tracer. He went in and helped the horse to bring it, because each horse would be a ton of them. Mm. And then Tommy Coach, the old blacksmith, he walked the wee bridge. And that was, but it went. They were cool too, and Wiley and them brought their boots in. They, they went to your cool there to be back just the same. So wh when was that? When was it last used? Never since the war, I don't think, John. Yeah, since before the war. Before the war, yeah. mm -hmm. Where did the coal come from? Quite heaven, mostly. Well, <coughs> <coughs> uh, quite... No, it's quite a... The harvest and the Ellen and Mary and McCormick brought in a puffer. He had a, a steam one come in, McCormick. But while this was the Ellen and Mary and uh, the harvest were while this and then the Logan Pools would be, they were puffers too. They yeah, were. And you know, in the morning, in the clear summer mornings, the fella emptied the buckets into the cart, he stood with. I put in each shaft, like at the, between the horse and the, at the back end of the horse, and he stood with a, uh, a foot in each shaft, and you could hear him shouting at the fellow, and I think, up a link or down a link to get the thing to tumble with him. Huh? You could hear that quite plain in the clock. <coughs> <coughs> that used to be, oh, that was very much boiled. It was boiled by a Logan men's mail once. She was, uh, she was a very great favourite with the old man, like the person Jim's grandfather. In fact, I ploughed that mare at the last ploughing match I ploughed because my horses didn't behave themselves and made a mess in the middle of the ploughing. And Jim's father took made the, the man that he was ploughing for Logan Men's and finished anyway. The said he only went five times when they had finished. And they took that, I've got these horses, and the old man walked up and down the field, the field with a whole day with his hand on her hip. And she was a great favourite. She was called for one of the daughters, the one that died. There. It was one of them, I can tell, a girl's died, yeah. quite young with appendicitis. <coughs> so, <coughs> she was a bit the only one that misbehaved at the going boat, you know. She was a wee bit nervous when she fit up and fit up, uh -huh. she sunk her feet, and then she wouldn't stop. And she never was called a gentleman or a lady either, before they got her out. Right time. So, I suppose the Weybridge belongs to the estate, does it? I would think so. Oh, I think it's certain sure it belonged to the state, uh, and uh, I, I don't know what the internal workings are said, but I don't know. Well, it's mm -hmm. a man's bar, you know. Mm. It. Have you seen the inside of one no. of them? No. 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 They're, they're very modern now, they're nearly computerised now. Mm. That one at Carter Kennedy is, yes, computerised. Mm -hmm. And uh, the one at, uh, where do you get into Carter Kennedy? No, where do you end up in more? It's as long as this room, but it's got to hold it. You know, a 30 ton log. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and that just flashes up on the screen and see what the weight of that is. But that uh, would certainly belong to the estate. Because the estate owned the whole thing in these days. I mean, all mm -hmm. these were owned by the estate. All the houses? Mm hmm. Uh, they were all sold in 1960 65, I think. We bought this from 1961, I think it was. We bought this one. This is the one I joined the light boat in, this one here. Oh, what was, was it, um, just an ordinary house then? Oh, it's just the same house only. That was two rooms at the other side, which is all I've knocked into one. Oh, and your like kitchen was two rooms? Kitchen was two rooms. Uh -huh. But the rest is just the same. Mm. No, no, it's no, because I, what the term, the back kitchen is now a utility room and a wee bedroom in the back of that. Well, the washing machine on that stays, but this room is just the same.
Mm-hmm. And who lived it in it when you joined the lifeboat then? The culture, Madame Gallery. She was a wee bit in there, a bit late. Uh, I, you find out that well, I, we've had bits about the life lifeboat in your um, Port yeah. Logan Hall tape, and mm-hmm. if there's anything I, else. I watched the lifeboat in Port Logan Hall. Because mm-hmm. actually, I was sitting here when I joined the lifeboat. No, next year was the one. I remember sitting here. And you were under 18, I know you said that. Well, sure, no. Three months over 16. I had to be 18. I should have been 18 before Lloyd's for insurance. Mm-hmm. So I just wiped two of us out right away. And wanted, the one's right over there. The one's the boat away. I saw her name the other night there. What I was it doing? She's still on the Thames. Oh, the lifeboat? Mm-hmm. Really? I don't know what I've done with it, Johnny, but I had it. But it's so very long ago I saw it. And I realised when, when I saw the light and that's what the name of the boat was. Oh. How did you find out? Jack McQueen told me. Oh. Uh, and he's followed it up quite a lot. I think it was Jim, Jim McQueen, his brother, was doing the research that that hand thing. Uh-huh. And he discovered she was still on the Thames. Goodness. I didn't start to tell you the name because I don't remember it, really. That's interesting to know it's still sailing, anyway. It's a pleasure boat. Uh-huh. I've got a bit of my life story. 